Greta Gertler Gold. Hello. Hello. You were born in actually in Boston during a snowstorm in the USA. Is that correct? Yes. How old were you when you left Boston to go to Australia? One. So at one year old, you went back to Australia and were living in Australia. So you're Australian and then you came back to New York and you're actually a New Yorker because you've been here how many years now? 22. 22 years. And you are also a composer, singer-songwriter, a writer, and you're a mum of two wonderful little kids called... Lila and Eben. You're also a a wife to a, a wonderful man called... Adam Gold. And you live in... Kensington, Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. First of all, I would like for the record to say, many years ago, Greta, it was thanks to you that I learned what it was to be an artist, because I believe you're a true artist through and through to every single fiber of your body. And many years ago, I noticed that, and I was kind of blown away by it, because it was so pure and true, and it set me on my own path to become a writer. So I'm always grateful and appreciative to you. Well, thank you, Jack. I- I have to say I'm also grateful to you for all of the support you gave me at that time and believing in me, which I really needed to keep going. And So back in Australia, you did music at your school. Yes, well, I, I have to give credit to my teachers who were incredible, including concert pianist Sarah Grunstein, who now lives in New York and has lived in New York for many years. But she was living in Australia for a few years and I was very lucky that she taught me piano for a little while. I loved music so much. I wanted to be a composer, got out of high school and got to university and didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do with music, but I, I knew that I wanted to be more social and I started writing songs and going to see bands, met some amazing musicians and was lucky to form a band called Peccadillo in the mid-90s. You were the lead singer and the composer for Peccadillo and the pianist. And I think that the space of being at the piano had become a, a space that I enjoyed being in. I see. So the piano became your own private world. Yes. Because actually no one can take that away from you. Somehow I think music had provided me with where I could get that spiritual release. Yeah. And I felt that was totally, unquestionably a good thing in the world. Music is good. One of the first pop songs that you composed was one called Dwell. Yes, it was actually at university. I was doing a class called Law and Gender and the teacher allowed us to write music or poetry or make a quilt or whatever we wanted to do for 50% of the assessment. So I decided to try writing a few songs and Dwell was one of the songs. That song Dwell, which let me for the record say that I always remained a huge fan of, had a life, didn't it? It did. Around that time I'd been tried to write songs for other singers because I didn't really want to sing them myself and I was not very comfortable with performing at that point. I loved so many voices of other singers in the Sydney music scene and one of the bands that I used to see was the Whitlams. I pitched a song to Tim Friedman, the lead singer of the Whitlams, that was called Man of the Moment and he ended up taking that song and sort of tweaking it lyrically and it became this song of Charlie Number 3 and it was on their breakthrough indie album Eternal Nightcap which won they won all these awards and it was a big breakthrough for them and it was a track on that album and I was really proud of that so after the success of that album they got asked to put out a record through Warner Music like a big commercial label and he was trying to get songs together for that album so he he heard me play Dwell with Peccadillo and I think I gave him a demo cassette of it and he he said oh that song has got a good chorus Like then the next thing I knew, he was asking if he could sing that song and also adapt it lyrically as well. And tragically, another bad mate of his had struggled a lot with gambling addiction and subsequently committed suicide. And the song Blow Up the Pokies came to be, which was Dwell adapted lyrically to be an anti-gambling anthem. And that became their biggest one of their biggest hit songs in Australia did that become a number one hit? I think it was top 
40. So the song's like an anti-gambling anthem, and I'm pretty proud of that song too. What happened is that, is that due to your collaboration with Tim Friedman and, and the Wetlands, you had two very popular songs there in Australia. Yes, and it was exciting because I had just moved to New York when Blow Up the Pokies was released. I could see that all these things were happening with the songs in Australia while I was in New York, and it was a really satisfying feeling to, to know that the songs were having a life in Australia and I was in New York and then in 2001 when September 11 happened I was able to survive off the songwriting royalties from Blow Up the Pokies. I decided to quit my day job which was working in a law firm as, as a secretary so that I could just spend my time working on an album which was called The Baby That Brought Bad Weather so I was able to sort of afford that album. When you were 28 you moved to New York. Why? When I first visited New York which was thanks to you in my mid-20s I realized that I had to live in New York. I just found it was so musical. It was there was music everywhere, incredible architecture and just everything was so big and inspiring and I think that the seeds of Sesame Street, fame, Woody Allen movies, all kind of everything had kind of converged and it felt like I was stepping into a world that where I could really dream of anything. And I'd also spent a few years in Australia trying really hard to be a musician there and it it was very difficult and I kind of had a breakdown and I just decided I think I should get out of here for a while and explore New York. That's what I did. And would you say that New York saved you then? Did it sort of help you? Yes. <laughs> and I do believe this city can do that. It can offer you opportunities and that might not exist elsewhere. There is a space for artists here. For the first seven years or so that I lived here, it was incredible, but also quite perilous at times and scary and up and down. And it did always dangle some hope for me, like the city and people I was meeting sort of seemed to offer things that kept me hopeful that I could keep being a creative person. I've covered the living room, this beautiful community of mainly singer-songwriters. It was like finding my people. Like Some of those went on to become very famous, like Nora Jones, but others were just incredibly inspiring. I think New Yorkers are really good at forming and uh, being part of communities. Yes, I agree with that. That's, that's the irony. Such a huge, giant, grand city, but it's really it's a lot of small communities that you have to find your people. You are now a mother of two wonderful kids and an artist in New York City. Yeah, well, it took a while for me to find a partner who I wanted to have a family with. And that by that point, I was in my late 30s. And then when we were ready to have kids, I was in my early 40s. And then we had a long journey of trying to have kids and needing a lot of IVF and help. That's a whole other story. And at age 44, I became a mum. If anyone is ever listening to this and they want any advice or any support with it, they should reach out to me because we did a lot of research and went through a lot and we're very lucky and I'd really like to share that with anyone who's interested. And also successful because you have two beautiful bouncing kids. In recent times, I decided to try to explore musical theatre because I could feel characters emerging in songs. You were actually working on some pretty wonderful projects in the world of musical theatre now. We've got to develop the show too. That's right. Yeah, you and I... Louisiana and New York. That's right, we um, have, and that was great <laughs> fun to do that. Hillary and I recently got the rights to the book Picnic at Hanging Rock, which was an iconic Australian story that was turned into a film by Peter Weir, but we are adapting it as a musical. And so you're a perfect amalgam of Australian New Yorker. I mean, I feel lucky to have both. I recently was granted Austrian citizenship as well, which is related to being the descendant of Jewish Holocaust survivors who fled Vienna. I just want to be a musician who composes music. I, I love New York for being so inspiring and for the people of New York who are just incredible people. That's what you're offering New York as well. Thank you. Thank you.